Saturday, the First Lady, and she's expressed a desire to sing our, our, our song. So, here's how we do it. I hope Gary has forgotten the tune. I hope you haven't forgotten the words. I hope I haven't forgotten the words. And I hope you haven't forgotten the words. Ah, one. Ah, two. Ah, three. Take me out to the floor. The Monday Morning Quarterback on the 5th of November, 2018, beaming from WBRN Radio and on the Boston Red Network. Old Boston Red himself here on the uh, eve of election 2018. We have some new numbers here uh, to talk about. We'll start out with voter uh, suppression, uh, one of the key elements of the 2016 election and several states here. This is Amy Gardner. She's from the Washington Post. One of the newspapers uh, singled out uh, by uh, D.J. Trump. But this is in fact factual. On Sunday voting rights ab- advocates uh, alerted uh, lawyers uh, for the uh, Georgia uh, Secretary of State as well as the FBI and Pro- uh, of a potential of vulnerability in the state's election system that they say could allow hackers to obtain uh, and alter uh, private voter information. The uh, Secretary of State, uh, Kemp, who is in our opinion a disgrace to the state of Georgia, the flag, the Constitution, everything else, as Secretary of State controls, and this is uh, President Carter denounced this uh, clown uh, controls the state election process even as he runs for governor responding to uh, accusations uh, accusations excuse me uh, of democrat uh, accusing excuse me democrats of uh, possessing software that could extract personal voter uh, data in his office opened an investigation of what he described as an attempt a failed attempt to hack uh, the uh, state uh, the state voter registration system Kemp called Democrats uh, power-hungry radicals who uh, should be held to account for their uh, criminal behavior. Democrats call the probe an abuse of power, no doubt it is. The controversy is the latest in a rash of uh, concerns uh, that uh, flared across the uh, nation as candidates in both parties have 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 traded, excuse me, Accusations about the threat to ballot integrity, integrity and multiple reports about voter irregularities. The issue has uh, started to affect voters' confidence, according to new polls, which show that a majority of voters in both parties are deeply suspicious about the opposing party's commitment to a fair elections. A growing up, row followed a spat of restrictive uh, Voter uh, laws passed by Republicans in recent years that are playing out across the country in closely contested races. Now, you'll hear in the media a continual theme that this is an election to, quote-unquote, end all elections. This uh, particular election is, midterm election, is not as much different from other elections. The difference is, primarily, you have an increased emphasis from social media, an increased emphasis from uh, corporate media, uh, particularly in covering the annex of D.J. Trump, the president. Now that is the difference. And also what you have is, is progressive, primarily progressive candidates and other Democrats running in areas that they have not put up candidates in 10 or 20 years, many of those, uh, in red states. So that in itself is... Uh, the reason this election is a little bit different. 
and uh, the uh, nationalization of the uh, election uh, by uh, D.J. Trump to nationalize the election based upon uh, him. And this is a little different, usually in midterm elections, depending on the popularity of the president. D.J. Trump stands anywhere from 40 to about 42 or 43 percent, which in modern times is not as bad as it would have been at one time. But still, it's not the kind of president that can run willy-nilly into every district. And one of the things to pay very close attention is, is where he goes and where he does not go. Unless it's an area where some Republican has uh, 15 or 20 points and consistent, consistently had uh, 20 of 15 or 20 points. There's a different elections there. And let me continue with this. All levels of government and law enforcement are watching carefully for voter fraud, including uh, doing early voting. That's what Trump tweeted. Uh, Cheat at your own peril. Violators will be subject to maximum penalties both a civil and criminal. Well, that's been going on for a very, very long time. If you recall, uh, the Trump administration uh, launched uh, a commission, a so-called commission. They had this uh, character uh, out of uh, Kansas there. We'll get to him in a minute. He was chair. That commission uh, collapsed. That's one of the things to remember. Nowhere has the issue been more prominent than in Georgia, where worries about voter disenfranchisement have dominated a bitter uh, race for governor between uh, Kemp and uh, Stacey Abrams, who is attempting to become the first uh, female African-American governor in the nation's history. The vast majority of voter registration applications suspended this year on their strict law have been uh, those of African-Americans, what we labeled the followers of O.J. Simpson. A uh, spokesman uh, for the uh, Secretary of State uh, said a decision to investigate potential cyber breaches. That's normally done uh, by the FBI, not by states. States do not really have the uh, type of uh, apparatus to do that. It was proper because it said an email uh, from uh, Democratic officials contained software capable of uh, trying to hack the uh, system. Using such software is a crime, she said, and which is, they haven't said what the software is. We'll get back to that. Uh, attempt fail hack. Attempt uh, SOS launch investigation in the Georgia Democratic Party. This is not unusual that one party will investigate the other party. But in this particular race, it's already toxic. It just becomes much more toxic. Our position is there were failed attempts to hack the system. Uh, yeah. All the evidence indicates that, and we are looking into a Democrat said email in question came from someone not affiliated with the party, and they produced an email showing that the party's voter protection and chief forwarded to uh, two cybersecurity experts. The party accused Kemp of defamatory accusations, while the Abrams campaign uh, said that Kemp's false accusations were a pathetic attempt to cover up his own failed security system. Voter right advocates are monitoring uh, several of those. The battleground states in uh, Georgia, Nevada, Indiana, and Wisconsin, hundreds of thousands of inactive voters have been removed from the rolls since the uh, 2016 election. Election officials said the uh, list maintenance comes after voters have not cast at least uh, ballots in uh, two federal elections. Voter rights activists are calling the activity improper of voter purge. A federal uh, appeals panel ruled uh, last week that Ohio must allow uh, thousands of voters removed from the rolls between uh, 2011 and 2015 to cast provisional ballots. In uh, North Dakota, we've given uh, some attention to this at uh, the Boston Red Network. Restricted voter law that, repl- uh, that requires voters to have a street address. Uh, may make it harder for, uh, it will make it harder uh, for Native Americans or Aboriginals to vote and are less likely to have the necessary ID cards. In Texas, some voters casting their ballot on electronic uh, machines reported that uh, choosing a straight Democratic uh, ticket, the machine uh, switched their choice uh, for a Senate from uh, Beto O'Rourke to uh, Lion Ted Cruz. State officials said they have removed fewer than uh, 20 reports of the glitch which they blame on old uh, voting machines and did not uh, expect to influence elections. Small numbers of similar reports 
emerged in uh, North Carolina and Georgia. In Dodge City, Kansas, where 60% of the residents are Latino, Ford County Clerk uh, Deborah Cox is on the fire for moving uh, the uh, city's only polling location from downtown to a location outside of the city limits. And I've never heard of this one before. A mile from nearby bus stops and citing uh, looming uh, construction just not even started. Federal judge rules on Thursday that's too close to election day to reopen the original location, but he noted that he was troubled by the email in which Cox, after the uh, American Civil Union, Civil Liberty Union, excuse me, asked her to uh, help publicize a voting information hotline. Now that's in a state where this character uh, Kobach is uh, the uh, in a uh, race for governor. His office weighed in on the Dort City by claiming that the second lo- location uh, would allow for the double voting. This is just crazy. I mean, more uh, lunacy uh, occurs out here. Let me finish this up. According to uh, Pew Center, Pew Center is uh, cited by everyone from the uh, people at the uh, Crystal Ball uh, to uh, Karl Rove uh, to the uh, Nate Silver operation, and we cite them also. Most Americans have confidence that local poll workers do a good job on Election Day, uh, Majority of both Democrats, 64% and 56% of Republicans say the opposing party has little or no uh, commitment to uh, fair and accurate elections, which is preposterous. In Georgia, uh, two regulations have caused the worries. A new law demanding that voter information on uh, registration applications exactly match existing uh, government records, even down to the hyphen. And that's uh, that's that's preposterous. What happens is in data entry, I've had that happen because I have a hyphenated last name. That many times people leave the hyphen out and just a space. At one time, there was no capability of putting a hyphenated a name in. You just had to put the whole name. Another requirement: voter registration match on an absentee ballot application and the ballot itself. All the signature require sign, signature requirement is uh, not new. Uh, a uh, surge in uh, absentee ballots uh, voting this year and in uh, rejected ballots has led to scrutiny of of its enforcement. This is usually uh, what happens there to reinforce uh, those kinds of situations. Voting rights groups sued after election officials rejected hundreds of absentee ballots suspending more than 50,000 voting applications. The vast majority of those, of course, obviously is African Americans. Two uh, federal judges sided with plaintiffs in both cases ordering state and local officials to stop rejecting absentee ballots over signature mismatches and to give voters a chance to verify their identity before uh, tossing uh, registrations. I've never, I've never uh, questioned uh, before now I've, uh, that my vote uh, could count, and this is from uh, Whitney uh, McGinney. McGinnis, excuse me. A Democrat who worked in uh, the uh, public administration, uh, worked in public administration, suburban Atlanta. McGinnis said that she had uh, had to send nearly two dozen emails to county officials to confirm that her absentee ballot would uh, would count after she told uh, was told her signatures didn't match. Well, that's just uh, preposterous. In North Dakota, uh, Native Americans have uh, decried a strict. Requirement that voters show identification bearing their fiscal address, which many do not have. They live outside service areas of the U.S. Postal Service and use uh, post office boxes for mail delivery. Election officials have uh, urged their votes uh, to voters to create physical addresses for themselves using uh, rural uh, address uh, databases that uh, service in nine eleven service provider uh, there, and it, that has been done uh, by uh, several uh, Native uh, American organizations. Uh, the tribal leaders are deploying officials to, to as many as 40 precincts with laptops, printers, and uh, CB radios. There's no cell service in many locations to help voters produce acceptable tribal IDs. And let's see what else we have here. Uh, 
I think this is the end of it. We'll give the number uh, for the ACOU uh, number before we uh, leave here. All right, let's go back. This is uh, from NBC News. Uh, Judge Nick efforts to open a new uh, polling uh, station in Dort City, uh, Kansas. Dateline uh, Topeka, the uh, Judge uh, Crabtree uh, denied a motion by the American Civil Liberties Union seeking a temporary uh, court order that would force the uh, clerk there, uh, Cox, to reopen a voting location at the old Civic Center after she removed the only public voting, voting place to a site outside the city limits. That is just uh, it's crazy. The only voting site for the city's now 13,000 registered voters for two decades was the uh, city center in a mostly uh, European part of town. Now they they moved it to the Expo Center after uh, learning construction was uh, planned for late October. The uh, ACOU asked a Crabtree to let it remain. Basically, conflict with ACLU over a single polling station uh, stretches back to at least in uh, May when Jimmy Dunlap, the uh, Democratic chairman and volunteer for the ACLU Voting Rights Project, had asked her to open the site. Southwest Kansas uh, City is located 160 miles, that is 256 kilometers west of Wichita. Once a destination for cattle drives where cowboys and gunfighters tangled, in recent decades it's a packing plant town which has uh, drawn to town to thousands of Latinos. It now uh, makes up a majority of the 27,000 people that populate the town. Cox is a Republican who served as elected clerk since uh, 2016. She sent a notice to uh, voters on September 28th and I think this is the end of it. I would like to use the word uh, impossible because I don't work in impossibilities. It would be extremely difficult. Uh, Kaskin uh, told reporters after the hearing it would even be without uh, uh, Brian Kaskin, the uh, state's, uh, let's see, election director in uh, the Kansas Secretary of State's office question whether Ford County would have enough time to find uh, and program uh, equipment, uh, etc. This is why the judge did not move it. The suit was on uh, behalf of uh, Rango Lopez, uh, an 18-year-old son of a Mexican immigrant who will be voting for the first time in uh, this election. Uh, Rango Lopez. Anyway, that's the story out of there. Let's go to some actual polling here. This is Real Clear Politics. Just to make sure we got all the polling here of the latest polling. This is uh, Monday, uh, since we get it up here. And this is NBC News, uh, Nelson uh, by four in uh, Florida. That's the Senate race in Florida. Copa, uh, Quinnipiac, uh poll has Nelson by seven in uh, Florida. That's the Senate race in Florida. In Missouri. Hockley up by four over Claire McCastle, 48 to 44. Um, and McSally, this is uh, ABC 15, we've seen that polls before, is up by one. Mitchell Research, uh, that's a respected polling organization in Michigan. Debbie Stabenow by seven. KSTP, a survey US A poll out of Minnesota. Where'd it go? Has Smith, the Democratic candidate, by eight over uh, Housley, uh, 48 to 40. Amy Klobuchar up by uh, 23 uh, points, as she's been consistently ahead. Another Quinnipiac poll has uh, Menendez in New Jersey up by uh, 15. And NBC uh, News Pro poll has Gillum up by four in uh, Florida over uh, DeSantis. Quinnipiac poll, wait a minute here, that's an NBC poll, Gillum by four. Quantipac has uh, Gillum up by a seven in Florida. Mitchell Research has Whitmire up by 14 in the governor's race, that is in Michigan. In New Hampshire, Sununu and Kelly are tied up 49-49. That's University of New Hampshire poll. 
Uh, in the first district, uh, Pappas up by 11. That's also University of New Hampshire. In the second nist- district, Casters up by 23. We've covered her uh, elections before. She is the incumbent. And on approval ratings at 41 from uh, CNN, ODJ Trump. And the generic ballot uh, there is at 23. From some Sunday programming. This is interesting here also. The Tafara Group, uh, Tafara Group uh, has uh, cinema up by three in Arizona over, uh, that's a Republican polling house, incidentally, over McSally. A Gravis poll has uh, Nelson up by three. That is in Florida over Scott. A Target poll, this is out of Michigan, is Stabenow up by ten. Uh, out of uh, Albuquerque Journal poll has Henrik up by twenty. That is, uh, let's see. In a New Mexico a Senate race uh, in New York, this is a uh, center a poll has Gildebrand up by 23. She's always been up by 23. Another Gravis poll, this was on Sunday, had uh, Gillum up by one. A Trafalgar poll, uh, this is Georgia Governor's race, had Kemp up. This is an interesting poll here by uh, 12. We'll be watching this race and see. This is the latest poll. And the target uh, poll uh, here out of Michigan has Whitmire uh, by uh, four. And uh, a Suna poll. We looked at the Suna poll. It's kind of an interesting poll here. Uh, Snit. Uh, Stit, I guess. Stit up by three over Edmondson, 47 to 44. Very close race there. Another poll here has Gritcham. Uh, that's a governor's race in the Albuquerque Journal. New Mexico up by a 10. And in New York uh, poll, this is a center up by uh, Como by 13. He's never been behind. California's uh, 48th district, Rockenbacher versus uh, Rauder. Rauder by one. That's a very close race. Rockenbacher has been around, as LBJ would say, since Christ was a corporal. Um, in uh, Florida, New York Times poll, Florida 6, uh, McBride by 2, uh, Illinois 14, Underwood uh, by 6, Iowa, this is the uh, white supremacist King by 5, it's a New York Times poll there. And let's see what else we had uh, from Sunday, a slew of polling here. Most of these are congressional races. Won't really go into these. Um, a a uh, IBD poll, a respected poll that has DJ Trump's at forty uh, percent, and the generic ballot from IBD um, he has the Democrats up by nine. Democrats have pretty much been up by anywhere from five to. Uh, 10 points on most of these generic uh, ballots. Now, one one thing to remember, these generic ballots are a national uh, question here. So we uh, kind of look here. Let me grab some other things very, very quickly here. The Business Insider poll, uh, Business Daily uh, poll. Um, we'll go to it right now. One of the most accurate polls in 2016 in the midterm, uh, Democrats open up a nine-point lead, according to uh, IBD's uh, poll. The top issues for voters in the midterm are the economy and health care, which uh, benefits each party. Polls found Trump still hasn't uh, closed the deal with the public on his uh, trade policies. There's no question that interest in the midterm is incredibly high for both parties. And this poll was conducted the 25th of October through November the 3rd finds uh, 74% of respondents saying they're interested in the current election than the previous one. The poll found 50% of likely voters say they have they prefer a Congress controlled by Democrats with 41% saying they would prefer one controlled by Republicans. Net for the Democrats in a generic ballot of 9 points, which is up 2 from the last time they were 40, what? 45-43. The economy helps the Republicans on the plus side. Trump's net approval rating remains uh, steady at 40%, while the share of those disapproving his 
performance dropped a point to 53. His net favorable uh, rating gained uh, slightly uh, to uh, a negative uh, 14. That is a uh, 40% favorable, uh, 54% unfavorable from last month's uh, negative 16. Trump also gained 1.9 in the leadership index as the uh, IBD's leadership index, which includes several questions on leadership, etc. Another benefit for the Republicans, the economy ranks at top list of uh, priorities, which 70, 77% of likely voters said is uh, highly important in making a decision which uh, they support the candidate. The economy is one of top priorities for independent voters. Trump and congressional Republicans have uh, clear uh, bragging rights over the current uh, boom and a spat of economic news, including a strong uh, GDP. Trump gets high marks as handling of the economy, with 47% giving him excellent or good rating, and that's up from uh, 46%, and uh, just 35% give him a poor rating. In contrast, Democrats uh, offer no country uh, proposals on the economy and have promised to roll back... Uh, the pro growth for tax cuts and deregulation efforts. Trump gets top marks uh, from uh, for handling the economy and creating jobs. That is uh, from Mr. Ravav Meur. I might pronounce his name. That is uh, Technometrics of Marketing Intelligence, is the name of that organization. Trading immigrants on the other side, Trump still has enclosed a deal there. On the immigration majority of public still oppose building a wall uh, on the southern border, 53 to 43% there. Not surprising, 87% of Democrats oppose the wall, while 85% of the Republicans are in favor of it. Nor has Trump uh, convinced the Republic that his the public, excuse me, that his trade policy is helping the economy. Fewer than one third of those polled, 23% said the tariffs are helping the economy. Well, 44% said they are uh, hurting. Even among Republicans, fewer than half, 42% say the tariffs are helping. Among independents, the split is uh, 20 uh, for helping and 45 for hurting. Healthcare, another trouble, uh, a sign of trouble for the Republicans. In fact, healthcare uh, ties the economy at top concern, 77%. Democrats have... Uh, made attacks on the Republicans, the other issue in order to import its national security, well, which 77% say is a high of importance, Supreme Court, uh, 70% immigration, 66% tariffs, uh, 59%. Climate change at 50%, national security comes at the top of the Republicans' concern list, it always is, but there's not very much there. Independence health care ranks uh, number one, 78%. Said it's of high importance. Uh, The economy, jobs come in at 73%. For Democrats, health care tops at 85%, followed by uh, climate change. Not very much on uh, climate change here. Now, let me go to. uh, I think, whoops. Here we go. This is national election turnout rates. from the uh, U.S. Election Project. You'll, you'll hear of this project named uh, very many, many times. These are turnout predictions. We'll just give a few. Uh, in the U.S., they predict 44.8% will uh, turn out in this election. That would be 105,526,000. The number of eligible voters is uh, 235 million seven hundred and fourteen and two or whatever. Anyway, in the state of Alabama, we will just get the uh, the turnouts here. Thirty-seven point one percent they project. Alaska much better at fifty-seven point five. Is that equates to three hundred thousand in Arizona? Forty-four point four percent. 2,200,000 people in Arizona. In Arkansas, 41%. You can see these are below 50%. 900,000 they expect. In California, 42.9%. 11 million. In Colorado, 
53.6%, over 50%, 2 million, 200,000 there. In Connecticut, 45.9%, a million, 200,000. The dis- uh, Delaware, 38.7%, District of Columbia, uh, 37.8%. Uh, in Florida, now this is a very important one here, 49.5% uh, is a turnout, 7,500,000. Are turning out there. The eligible voter population in uh, Florida is uh, 15,140,064. In the state of Georgia, another very important one, uh, 48.8% uh, percent is the projected turnout, 3,500,000. Uh, the actual voting uh, circumference is, is 7,178,000. Uh, in the state of Hawaii, 39.4%. 400,000 is the projection there. In Idaho, 48%. A half million projected to turn out there out of a million. Uh, 224,000. State of Illinois, 45.5,000. That equates to 4,000, 4 million, excuse me, 100 out of 9 million plus voters in the state of Illinois. Indiana, 44.7%. Uh, which uh, pro- uh, projected uh, roughly 2,200,000 and 4,993,000 are there. In the state of Iowa, a higher percentage here, 56.2%, uh, 1,300,000 in the state of Iowa. Kansas, 48.3%, uh, a million, uh, roughly 2,000,000. In the state of Kentucky, the lower percentage here, 36.1 percent, 1 million and 200 out of 3 million 319 thousand. State of Louisiana, 38.3 uh, uh, there, that's uh, a million 300. Uh, Maine, a uh, high turnout state, 66. Point 60, excuse me, point six and 650 thousand. That's respectable. Maryland, 46.4 percent, 2 million people turn out there. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 49.6 percent, 2 million five turnout of out of 5 million. Uh, 042. Michigan, a higher turnout rate there, 53.2, 4 million will turn out out of 7 million 500 thousand. Minnesota, 61.5, 2 million 500. Uh, thousand uh, out of four million there, so uh, a good turnout there in Mississippi, thirty-eight point six, Missouri, forty-nine point two, hotly contested race there, two million two hundred and fifty thousand out of four million five hundred and seventy thousand, Montana, fifty-six point six, uh, four hundred and sixty-five thousand out of eight, and so uh, yeah, good turnout. Nebraska, 44% turnout, 600,000. Nevada, 42% turnout, uh, 875,000. And New Hampshire, 51%, uh, roughly half a million people. Jersey, 44.2, 2 million, 700,000. New Mexico, 45.6, 675,000. New York, 39.9. Five million uh, five hundred thousand out of thirteen million, basically. North Carolina forty-two point uh, two, and that is uh, three million there out of seven million. North Dakota three hundred thousand turnout of fifty-three point two million. State of Ohio uh, forty-eight point one and four million uh, two hundred and fifty thousand out of eight million. 800 whatever and change there. Uh, let's see, did we get North Dakota? Yeah, Ohio, Oklahoma, 41.1. They actually need more there for the Democratic candidate to win. That would be a turnout of 1,150,000. That's 2,768,000. We remember Jerry Pippen, obviously, here, because we broadcast the Jerry Pippen broadcast movie. Anyway, in the state of Oregon, 50. Uh, 1.4, that is 1,600,000 out of 3 million. So that's mail-in ballots in that state. State of Pennsylvania, 
46.1500 out of 9,758,000. Rhode Island, 47.3375,000. South Carolina, 38% turnout, 1,450,000. South Dakota, 53, that's 340,000 people, small state. State of Texas, 42.1, they project that would be 7,600,000 out of 18 million. And Mr. O'Rourke will need as many as he can get there. Uh, Utah, 38.4%, 800,000. Vermont, 54.2, 207,000. Virginia, very important state there, 45.6, 2,800,000 out of 6,141,000. Washington State, 48.9, that's 2,600,000 out of 5,316,000. West Virginia, 600,000, that's 42.7% out of 1,405,000. Wisconsin, a high turnout state, 59.9%, 2,600,000 out of uh, 4,337,000. And And lastly, Wyoming, 47.4%, 200,000. Not very many 60% uh, uh, turnouts here. 61% in uh, Minnesota, 60% in uh, Maine. Anyway, this is uh, in advance of these... uh, the excess polls of Edison Media Research and the predicted turnout rate uh, for each uh, in absence of, uh, in advance, excuse me, of the 2000, the exit poll uh, team uh, there and uh, predicted turnout for each state uh, will need uh, to be uh, for certain aspects of running exit polls. Election night of forecasting. These estimates represent our best guess. Vote eligible eligible population, that is VEP, represents an estimate of persons eligible to vote regardless of voter registration status in an election uh, and is constructed by modifying voting age population uh, by a component reported in the right column. Now, you can be citizens and non-citizens and have voting age population. We didn't go into it, but if you go to uh, bostonred.org, you can find everything. So now we run along here, checking out time. We're doing pretty well. Uh, And get over to ESPN and do the sports like we know what we're doing. We'll be doing college uh, basketball, uh, excuse me, college football, the NBA. We'll start with the NBA, and then we'll do a college. Let's do the NBA scores. First, the Kings were at the Bucks in, um, wait a minute, in Milwaukee. Bucks 144-109. The 76ers were in Jersey. Uh, the Nets 122-97. to uh, The Knickerbockers were at the Wizards in D.C., and the Wizards had magic. 108 to 95. Wizards. The Magic and the Spurs in a San Antonio. Good game. Uh, Magic 117 to Spurs 110. The Grizzlies and Suns in Phoenix. A very close game. 102 for the Suns and 100 for the Grizzlies. The T Wolves and Trailblazers in Oregon. It was all Trailblazers. 111 to 81 for the T Wolves. And the Raptors and Lakers in Los Angeles. The Raptors actually beat the Lakers. Hmm. Uh, 121 uh, for the Raptors and 107 for the Lakers. And uh, that is uh, the NBA. On to the college hoop. This is the top 25, incidentally. Tampa and uh, UCF. Or UCF 52 to 40. Pittsburgh and Virginia. It was Pittsburgh 23 to 13. Number one, Bama shut out LSU, an embarrassment, no doubt. 29 zip. Louisville and Clemson. Boy, a basketball score. 77 to 16, Clemson, uh, number two over Louisville. Notre Dame and Northwestern. Notre Dame pulled us out 31 uh, to 21. Penn State and Michigan. 
Penn State should have stayed home. Michigan 42-7 to at Georgia in Kentucky. It was all Georgia 34-17. to Oklahoma and Texas Tech. Oklahoma 51-46 to for Texas Tech. The Red Raiders. California and Washington State. It was Washington State 19-13. to Nebraska wants the mighty big red machine no more. Ohio State uh, 36 to 31. They're ranked number 10. Missouri and uh, Florida. Missouri actually beat Florida 38 to 17. West Virginia and uh, Texas. At one point of there, West Virginia at Texas 42 to 41. Utah and Arizona State was Arizona State 38 to 20. Iowa and Purdue, the old Boilermakers, that was a close game. Uh, Purdue, uh, 38 to 36. Louisiana Tech and Mississippi State, it was all Mississippi State, 45 to 3. And Syracuse and uh, Wake Forest, Syracuse, 41 to 24. Texas A and M and Auburn. It was Auburn twenty eight to twenty four. Florida State and North Carolina State. It was all North Carolina State forty seven to uh, twenty eight. Boston College and Virginia Tech. Boston College pulled it out by ten points thirty one to uh, twenty one. Fresno State and U uh, in uh, L V. It was Fresno State. They were ranked twenty three forty eight to three. Iowa State in a Kansas. It was Iowa State, uh, forty. Excuse me, twenty-seven to uh, three. Been a long and winded uh, race here, and let me just check out real clear that uh, last gas, as they say, to see if they have anything new coming up for us. Incidentally, we'll be back. Uh, a production called a politic. Sometime in the evening here, uh, our early, probably will be early Tuesday morning. Tuesday, of course, Election Day, we uh, encourage people to vote. You can tell it's been a long thing here. I don't see anything uh, new here. Uh, let me just do one other thing here and get the ACLU uh, number here, something that you need. And we'll get this out on the editing, but we'll get the... Have the voter uh, ACLU voter hotline. Okay, uh, contact the election protection hotline. That is 866 Our Vote. Again, 866 Our Vote. Our Department of Justice voter rights hotline 800 253 391. Period. This is the ACLU again. 866 our vote that's for the ACLU and uh, for the Department of Justice I want to take a chance is at uh, 800 253 so the final argument is up here uh, basically we at the Ouija board see this election as dynamic there will be uh, House seats uh, lost on the Democratic side uh, and hopefully many more on the Republican side. Uh, this is a preliminary situation. Will the Democrats make their magic number? Our model says yes, they will make their, their magic number. Now we have one <coughs> excuse me, we have one other model, the uh, slide rule model. And we'll check it and get our final estimation in there. The people at Battle Line Incident, they'll come up next uh, from CBS's Battle Line, their panel discussion. I believe they put it at, uh, from uh, their cap is at, at 25 uh, for the Democrats. We just leave it at, they'll get to Congress. Uh, because it, it it's very, very uh, tenuous. Uh, on a bunch of the infinitive if, if, ifs. Now, as we look into many of these states, if Florida, for example, Gillum has in the public polling consistently been ahead uh, by a few points, uh, at least uh, tied or ahead in the margin of error. 
And recently, the recent polls today put him a little bit out of the margin of error. If he can pull this off, uh, that will uh, help uh, Bill Nelson, no doubt. As maybe a package deal, that could be one, could be the other one. Uh, you know, a lot of the uh, pundits and modelers, uh, Nate Silva's kind of passed on this. Because first of all, uh, midterm elections are very unpredictable, uh, normal ones. This is sort of like we had the hung election that we covered in Australia. And uh, we also covered elections in the UK. We do a lot of elections, and we do a lot of elections uh, and get it right wherever people didn't get it, so to speak. As in the case of 2016, we had D.J. Trump ahead uh, since his nomination uh, period. He never really fell behind. And on our secondary slide rule model, we showed uh, the Hillary Clinton of New York as uh, coming on. But again, don't be confused in national polling particularly in presidential races in, in particular, in uh, some of these states that uh, were very, very narrow. There are uh, concerns, no doubt about that. Minnesota, for instance, in the 8th district there, it appears from the public polling that the Democrats will lose that seat. It's tenuous in Minnesota 1, but at the same time, the public polling uh, in uh, some of the other seats, Paulson there, uh, Jason, or whatever his name is, uh, there that they could be, as, as one would say, knocked off the block. So there will be some going up, some will be coming down. In these type of elections, if you can uh, do 50 50, but at the same time, what's happening in the House, you increase your odds. So a lot of this will come out of some of those states, particularly out of places like Pennsylvania. We're looking there to gain some uh, seats. In, in uh, California is capable of doing that. So when we come back with La Politics, that's our midterm uh, summary. We'll be more definite on this. We'll go through race by race. It takes a little longer. We already got the uh, turnout uh, projection, so we put that into the model, and we'll have uh, the best information for you. Have a good week, everyone. We'll talk to you soon. And Anthony Salvanto. Anthony, let's start with you. Okay, so we've talked about this 225 for Democrats. So what else inside those numbers? Let's talk first about, say, young voters, right? So this is an important part of the Democratic coalition. What are your numbers showing about their participation and also your survey numbers, but also what we've learned from the early vote? Well, what we've learned from the early vote is that it has gotten younger compared to past midterms question will be, is it young enough? And that so far seems like it is not yet young enough. So there will be some factor in turnout coming into Election Day. Look, big picture. In the polling, the Democrats are highly dependent on people who say that they have not voted in midterms before. And that's going to be about 20 percent of their vote if those polls are borne out on Election Day. If those folks don't show up, we've rerun the models and the Republicans hold the House. Republicans, you know, hold the House. Dems only get to 215, a little gain, but not close enough. Amy, there's been a lot of showing up going on. It's not just on Election Day, not just with early vote, but there's been checks written by people. There have been uh, special elections. So how do you see the electorate shaping up based on that longer history? Well, that longer history is what brought Democrats to this moment. Their enthusiasm gap that they had for much of 2017 and 2018 allowed them to do the following things. One, they got a lot of candidates who announced that they were going to run for Congress in places they've never competed in before. So they expanded the playing field from what looked like early in 2017, it was going to be 25 or 30 seats to about 60 seats now that Republicans hold where Democrats are competitive. And the second thing, and this is very important now, of course, is the money. I have never seen so much money going to House candidates. And it is going to those candidates directly. It's not just the campaign committees or the big names that are getting these dollars. These, these are candidates who two years ago never thought they were going to run for Congress. And now they're sitting on three, four million dollar war chests. That has kept Democrats not just competitive in some of these places, but in many places, they're out 
raising and they're running more ads than the Republicans who are the incumbents. That doesn't happen in a normal election. And as I know from reading uh, Amy Walter, is that in the last <laughs> quarter of fundraising, 112 Republican held seats, Democrats outraised them, That's which right. means it's broad. That's right. And it's Amazing. keeping them in the game in a lot of these places where, quite frankly, looking at the numbers, they probably would have been knocked out. Democrats would have. Uh, because these districts are not easy. They're Republican-leaning districts. So uh, they're Republican-leaning districts. They're Republicans hold them. Incumbents have an advantage on Election Day. So what's holding the Republicans together? Well, uh, I think about the people I talked to on Friday in Indiana with the president. You ask them, what is this election about? An open-ended question. Leave it up to them. Every single person in line I talked to said immigration. They're concerned about this caravan that's coming and security issues generally and and, and caravan that's 800 miles away. that's more than still. 800 miles yeah. away and it is mostly women and children and you know if it's not that it's just security generally and how the identity and the fabric of the country may change as people like that are allowed to get in um, but I you know you talk to Democrats and and when I was in Wisconsin talked to a woman uh, who's devoted hours of her time to manning a office in Milwaukee and I said why do you do this and she says well it's very simple I want to protect my Obamacare you go down to Waukesha County a few miles away and you talk to a Republican woman doing the exact same thing. And Valerie told me it's because I want to be proud of my country again. So, again, issues of identity and security mm -hmm. for Republicans, domestic issues of concern like health care for Democrats I, across the country. Oh, can I also jump in on demographics? And Anthony can jump in with me, too. You're right that Democrats have, you know, that always have this demographic aspiration that doesn't necessarily turn up at the polls. Right. But Republicans have a demographic challenge in midterms, too, which is the base for Donald Trump are, yes, they're older and whiter, but uh, they tend not to have higher levels of education. And those voters also don't tend to show up in a midterm election year. So what Trump is doing right now in ginning up the base, we talk a lot about who he needs to get out to vote. It's those voters who he had turn out for him in 2016 who most likely would sit out a midterm election. Well, Anthony, let me build on this, but let me add one more thing to it, which is there are those who wear the red ma uh, Make America Great hats again. They go to the rallies. They show up in force. There was a part of the Republican coalition in 2016, though, who said, not quite so sure about Donald Trump, but I really don't like Hillary Clinton. And that, that helped motivate their Republican vote. Where are those voters in this in this uh, question on Tuesday. And that's where, to the extent there is crossover, that's where it's coming from. We have seen, we have talked about all fall, these voters who say the economy is good, give the president credit for the economy, and yet say they are unsatisfied with the direction of the country. That's a surprising split, and they are trending towards the Democrats. And, you know, again, the, the picture of these districts, when we get to election night, we start talking about this place, that place, they're going to be suburban districts. There's going to be an argument going on about what the Republican Party looks like now. These districts were carved out for the Republicans of 10 years ago. But the Republican Party since then has gotten a little less diverse in terms of demographics, a little bit more rural and a little bit more working class. Do they still fit into these districts? Can they still win them? It's going to be in a sort of an overarching theme on election night. In a, a fact that was in a Harris poll this week, I found interesting. They asked Republicans, do you consider yourself to be more a supporter of Donald Trump or more a supporter of the Republican Party? Forty six percent said Donald Trump. Uh, the party and Chairwoman McDaniel won't have liked this is just at 25 yeah. percent. So this is Donald this Trump's is party. This is Donald Trump's party in his election. And, and you have to remark about just how amazing it is that we've gotten to this point. If we go back to 2015 and look at Donald Trump's favorable ratings among Republicans in 2015, it was something around 40 percent. Now he has, in the last Gallup poll, I think an 89% approval rating from Republicans. That's what makes this election also so different from traditional midterms is that normally what happens in a midterm, the party that's in the White House, less motivated to turn out than the party out. They're not as excited about their candidate as they were in the presidential. This year, Republicans are united around him in a way we didn't see with Obama in 2010. And they're more motivated to vote than, say, Republicans were in 2006. And not only is the president on the ballot, which is to say on voters' minds, in larger numbers than typical in midterms, but the number saying they want to support him right. is larger than it's been in typical midterms. Often the opposition number outweighs the four number in terms of is the president a factor in your vote. Ed, uh, women, OK, both on the ballot and as voters, what's your take of what we should think be looking for on Tuesday? I think either way, we're going to see more women elected into Congress, which actually changes the governing dynamic come January. You may see as many as, I think, 26 
women elected to the Senate. That would be a record high. Uh, you'll see an increase certainly in the Democratic ranks. But based on projections right now, there's a good chance that the number of House Republican women will be so depleted uh, that they're down to like two hands, basically, uh, which is an embarrassing low in a year where so many women are anticipated to vote, not only in the suburbs, but really all across the country. All right. Thanks very much, Ed. Amy's going to stick with us. Anthony, uh, you'll be just at the table from now until <laughs> Thursday or something, I think. Anyway, don't go away. We'll be right back with our political panel. Everything is on the line on election night. You got the future of the Trump presidency on the line, the future of Congress. We're looking for answers to what voters are thinking. And what does that tell us about politics in America right now? Election season builds to a crescendo for us. There's a lot of prep work to make sure that reporters and graphics and other elements are all in the right places. You'll have maps and graphics that show at a glance how results are stacking up. We've optimized the website so the results appear as quickly as possible. And we are able to present them in ways that allow you to dig deeper, to get the granular story where you live, and then look at the bigger picture. Join us, election night 2018 with the Washington Post. And we're back with our political panel. Amy Walter is with the Cook Political Report. Ben Dominich is the publisher of The Federalist. Shauna Thomas is the Washington Bureau Chief at Vice News. And Nancy Cordes is our CBS News Chief Congressional Correspondent. She spent most of the week in Florida and Georgia on the campaign trail. We're glad to have you in one place for us here, <laughs> Nancy. Here. Um, ben, I want to start with you. The chairwoman of the Republican Party did not want to touch that ad run by the president's uh, campaign with a 20-foot pole. <laughs> um, uh, so that's one thing which you can address, but also it represents two closing messages here. Mm -hmm. um, chairwoman McDaniel wants to talk about the economy and the strong numbers. The president wants to Talk about something else. You know, it's really telling that this is the closing weekend of a campaign season. The president just got all these great numbers in terms of the economic reports that came out. We have wage growth that we haven't seen in you know, more than a decade in terms of the experience of the American uh, uh, economy. And yet that doesn't seem to be the thing that he wants to talk about at all. It's not the thing that Republicans are really talking about. This is an election that for them is a base election. And, and what they know is that the, what gets their base out there and excited and uh, ramped up is questions of security, questions of toughness, yeah. questions of law and order, and not, hey, you've got 3.1 percent wage growth. Right. Don't you have the same exact problem on the other side, which is when you hear an ad like that, when you hear some of the things the president says, People who are black, Hispanic, are saying, this sounds a little bit racist to me. And that can gin people up on the Democratic side, too. And not only that, you had Republicans saying, this sounds racist to me. So it That's wasn't even, true. I mean, it was extraordinary to see so many Republicans come out and just straight up say this was a racist appeal. Nancy, you've been, uh, Anthony, sorry, I'm used to having Anthony to my left, <laughs> Nancy. Um, you've been out there. Yep. We shape this race in a lot of ways, but but out in the in the real world, um, what are you seeing? How much are Democrats being talking about health care and not taking the bait on some of these values issues or what just what, what are you seeing? Health care is huge. In fact, uh, over the course of this election, Democrats have spent about 90 million dollars on ads about health care. They think that this is the winning issue. Obamacare is much more popular now than it was even a few years ago. At this point, everyone knows someone with a pre-existing condition who is getting coverage because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, everybody watched Republicans fun fumble this issue last year when suddenly they had the opportunity to come up with a plan uh, that was panned by most health care groups, and people are worried about protections for people with pre-existing conditions going away. Democrats believe that that is going to be a motivating factor for enough voters, and some of the polling bears that out. Shauna, there's, the Democrats have shown a, a remarkable, um, I think of Will Rogers' line, I'm, a, I'm not a member of an organized party, I'm a Democrat, <laughs> shown amazing discipline and sticking to the health care message despite the efforts by the president and the press to pull them on to something else. Do you see it that way? I see it a little bit that way. I think one of the things that's been interesting to me is I was in Idaho, which is not a bastion of Democratic politics, I understand, last week. 
But Medicaid expansion is on the ballot. Yeah. And even with conservatives, they seem to be going in the direction of voting for entrenching Obamacare within Idaho. Um, and while that doesn't mean like there will suddenly be a Democratic governor of Idaho, that does mean there's something to that health care message that speaks to a lot of people. And Democrats know that. And some in, in some of these swing districts, that could help them turn some of the Republicans their way, possibly. And it's also why the issue about the economy and the tax cuts isn't getting as much traction, not just from the president, but even in some of these congressional races, because what you hear from voters a lot is, that's great, maybe have a little more money, but you know what I'm spending it on? My prescription drugs, or I'm spending it on my health care costs. The, the cost of living is going higher than what I'm getting in in my salary or whatever I got from the tax cut. And so it's a very difficult message for Republicans to sort of nuance this discussion about how great the economy is with people who are actually worrying about the most salient thing in their life and the thing they probably spend the most money on other than food, which is their health care. I was down in Florida this week talking to Carlos Corbello, who is in one of these classic swing districts in Florida. He said that he wishes the president would talk more about the economy. I mean, we've got we're at three point seven percent unemployment. We haven't seen a level that low since Lyndon Johnson. But the president himself admitted this week it's boring to talk about the economy. He'd rather gin people up and talk about immigration. And that is really difficult for a Republican like Curbelo in a swing district. Well, that's why he said that caravan really ginned up our base in mm -hmm. when he was in his rally. Ben, let me... Uh uh, Mike Kaufman, 6th District of Colorado, another one of those tough mm -hmm. seats. Up, uh, he, One of his strategists said, in the last week, the president has behaved like a guy trying to build a permanent political majority in the Ozarks. The purposeful <laughs> provocation on immigration just makes an already grim situation in the suburbs even more difficult. Is this a president running uh, in a kind of Senate, save the Senate strategy, which but, but which hurts in these suburban districts that Shauna was talking about? Absolutely. And I think that that's because the Senate matters more to the president than a lot of these different House members, many of whom he doesn't even know. You know, he doesn't he doesn't have a relationship with them. He knows who John Tester is. He knows who Heidi Heitkamp is. He knows who Claire McCaskill is, and he dislikes them and he wants to see them out. And so that's the reason that he's using the kind of approach that he has. But I think Republicans need to keep in mind, you know, one of the real things we're going to learn in this midterm is how effective the president's strategy is in comparison to the approach that President Obama used. The problem with President Obama was that when he was on the ballot, his team came out, his base came out, they showed up. This is now President Trump trying to figure out whether he can do the same thing, uh, uh, you know, in, in an election when he's not on the ballot, which was the same problem that was a real challenge for during the Obama years for other Democrats. In, in the exit polls in 2010, Democrats did not come out for President Obama to defend him in the way that our polls show that Republicans are coming to defend Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's where that low propensity voter that I talked about earlier with Anthony, especially these voters... On the Republican side, they came out for Donald Trump, don't traditionally come out. An issue like the economy, that's not going to motivate them get, to get out to vote. On immigration, that's yeah. going to be the issue. The question, though, in my mind, too, is there are sort of these different tiers of yeah. seats that I'm going to be watching on election night. There's the tier that we talk about, those suburban districts, especially those suburban districts that Hillary Clinton carried Northern Virginia suburbs, Philadelphia suburbs. Thankfully, a lot of these are on East Coast time. For those of us <laughs> on the East Coast, we can watch these come in. New Jersey. But there are the districts I'm most interested, actually, are the ones that President Obama carried, but yep. then Trump carried, mm -hmm. right? Those districts, like, for example, in Maine, another East Coast sure, state, too. big Maine, mm -hmm. too. It's big, big, has Democratic DNA. This is a la labor stronghold there. Been voting for Democrats forever, but like so much of working class America moved to Trump in 2016. Where did those voters go in 2018? That's going to tell us, first of all, whether Democrats have a great night or just an OK night. And also what it means about this Trump coalition. Do they show up for, only when Trump's on the ballot or have they also decided they're not as enamored with Trump in some of these places that have Democratic DNA than in some of the other parts of the country, like the South. And look, let's face it. I mean, Democrats have almost nowhere to go but up. Republicans have a near historic majority in the House right yeah. now. They picked up 63 yeah. seats back in 2010. Yeah. They added to it after that. So if Democrats don't pick up seats <laughs> on Tuesday right. night, then the party has even bigger problems right. yeah. than they thought. And a historic anomaly. Hold this, these thoughts. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more from our panel. Nineteen ninety. More from our panel. Shauna, you've been looking at the 25th District in California. Yeah. Why? 
Well, basically, one, Vice News has been following Katie Hill around since February to, like, track how a congressional campaign works. But what's interesting is this is one of those districts that went for Hillary Clinton in 2016, but elected a Republican congressman. It is an incredibly tight race, and it's gotten tighter in the last few weeks. And it doesn't seem like it's because of health care. It doesn't seem like it's because of immigration or race baiting. It seems like it's because there's a gas tax repeal on the ballot. And these are people who live 40, 50 miles from L.A. proper. They vote on their pocketbooks. It's actually actually kind of standard politics, which I have to admit, I was kind of happy to see. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Reg- regular old politics. Exactly. Not- <laughs> Your pocketbook and gas. Right. right. Yeah. Exactly. Nancy, what are you going to be looking for on Tuesday night? Well, I'm watching for a couple of things. First of all, women. I think that that's going to be really fascinating. I mean, anecdotally, we see that women, particularly educated women, have been uh, turned off by some of the things that President Trump has to say. They were turned off by the Kavanaugh nomination spectacle. Are they really, uh, you know, moving towards the Democratic Party or, you know, do they come home at the end of the day? Um, I I think for me, another thing is, is, is independent voters and whether President Trump really is the kryptonite to independent voters that we've seen in some of the polling recently. Um, And then finally, this split between the House and the Senate. I mean, it's very possible that even if Democrats take control of the House, they could lose a seat or two in the Senate. And what does that mean for uh, the balance of power in Washington and the ability of Congress to get anything done over the next two years? Ben, do you think that Republicans are taking lessons from what the president's doing? And maybe the lessons will all be determined by the final outcome. But let's say Republicans have a better night What will Republicans see from the president's strategy here at the end? I mean, you know, what learnings will they take from that going forward? Well, I think that they'll be, uh, frankly, one of the lessons they'll take is that uh, it doesn't it doesn't help to sort of shy away from cultural war. I think the president has really, you know, wrapped his arms around the cultural war in America in a way that we haven't seen a politician do before in the modern era. And I think that the lesson that a lot of different Republican politicians are taking away from that is that this is something that they should be eager for. In terms of what I'm kind of going to be looking at, the early on in the in the night, I think we're going to know how big of a wave we're going to see thanks to some of the kind of pairs of seats in some of these early East Coast states. I look at something like Virginia 5 and Virginia 7. If both of those goes, go to Democrats, then that means that we're probably in for a blue tidal wave. Uh, and historically, that is, I think, what we should expect to happen in this in this election. We should expect it to break in the direction of Democrats and yeah. break in that way significantly. On the flip side, I look at a, a state like Florida and, and anticipating the kind of historical ticket splitting that you've seen there could easily result in a situation where perhaps Rick Scott wins the Senate seat, Andrew Gillum wins the governorship. That's going to be a huge uh, factor in terms of determining things post the next census and everything else that happens uh, in a state that's critical for the presidential year. You've been down in Florida. You see, what, what, what have you noticed in Florida that's different from every other Florida when we're obsessed <laughs> with Florida every other election? Well, we it's have. fascinating to have this marquee race, you know, at the top of the ticket, this governor's race that is driving, you know, that is driving so much. I think Senator Nelson, for example, would be in much worse shape if he didn't have this incredibly dynamic campaigner at the top of the ballot in Andrew Gillum, uh, who's sort of, you know, if, if, if Nelson does win, on Tuesday night, he will have Gillum in part to to thank for that. But I, I'll also be very curious to see, you know, some of the the strategy for Andrew Gillum, for someone like a Stacey Abrams in Georgia, for someone like a Beto O'Rourke in Texas, has to do with change, fundamentally yes. changing the electorate in their states. And they have a lot of confidence that they're doing that. We see some anecdotal signs in early voting that they might be right, but it's so it's it's a peril to read too much yes. into early voting. Um, But that is going to be fascinating as well. At the end of the day, did they manage to really change the electorate in their states, bring out hundreds of thousands of new voters, minority voters who don't typically vote in midterm elections, let alone presidential elections? And that's going to set the tone for 2020, uh, quite frankly, because for all the talk about what's what is the president doing to see if he can get his base out and what lessons are Republicans going to take from this? What lessons are Democrats going to take if they succeed or if they fail about the kind of candidate they need on top of the ticket in 2020? It's the lessons from the culture war that you're talking about, the Republicans learn that embracing that works. If we also see an amazing turnout of minority voters in Florida and Georgia, Stacey Abrams, Andrew Gillum win, that that shows that that culture war may not be a good thing to embrace come 2020. Mm -hmm. What what role do you think the president has played, if at all, President uh, Obama here talking about? I mean, he, you know what? I, I always ask a bunch of Democrats all the time who is the leader of the Democratic Party, and usually the answer I either get is they don't know who the leader of the Democratic Party is, or Barack Obama is the leader of the Democratic Party. 
the guy who's at the top still, the guy who energizes people, is coming out. That reminds people that there is an election. I think that's about the best you can do right now. And what do you make of the Midwest? We had the president doing well there in 2016. The, <laughs> uh, the president did well there in 2016. People said, oh, the Midwest is changing. But now a lot of Republicans are in trouble. You, in you could absolutely see Scott Walker lose, I think, um, you know, on, on Tuesday. I think you could see uh, a lot of difficulty in parts of the Midwest. But back to this culture war point, I think that the fact is you look at a state like Missouri where Claire McCaskill made the calculated judgment to go against Brett Kavanaugh in, in a similar situation to what was facing Joe Manchin, a state where the president is significantly popular, uh, and that's really, frankly, put Josh Hawley back into a position where he could beat her, when before it was a race that looked like it might not might actually be out of reach for Republicans. This is going to be a very interesting night because there's so many different lessons to take away from it. Democrats are going to be able to take a lesson away of, yes, we resisted, yes, we came back, we took back the House after you know uh, having all these uh, years of, of not being able to be in leadership post the Obamacare decision, uh, and then Republicans are going to, I think, take a, a lot of lessons away from which senators they are able to replace. If, if any, on the Democratic side. That's going to uh, flow into the decisions they make in 2020, as Amy said, about the nomination battle. And in 1982, Walter Mondale was on the CBS Evening News on election night preparing for his 84 race. So 2020 is going to start right on election <laughs> night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying that's what, that's, that's what history tells us. I can't, not me, it's history. Thanks to all of you for being with us, and we'll be right back. Small loan from my father. You've got to start somewhere. They would have control of the House if it works out that way. By a narrow margin. By a narrow margin. Ed, do you think, what's your assessment of that? Uh, that, that it, it seems to be heading in that direction, but it is going to be close. You've said it repeatedly for months. As long as Democrats turn out people who don't normally vote in midterm elections, they can do it. If they don't show up, they're going to come up short. Right. Same thing. Although what we notice is the closest races, Anthony looks at a lot of these, they tend to break all one way at the very end. So we could see a big wave for a very few number of seats. All right. We're going to talk a lot more about the wave, its size and its color. So stay with us. Don't go away. Well, it's about, say, young voters, right? So this is an important part of the Democratic coalition. What are your numbers showing about their participation and also your survey numbers, but also what we've learned from the early vote? Well, what we've learned from the early vote is that it has gotten younger compared to past midterms. Question will be, is it young enough? And that so far.